Well, find your seats. Have we had an impactful day so far? Woo! All right. Our last speaker of the day, I had the pleasure of meeting, guess where? On LinkedIn, that's exactly right. So I told you, if you're not on LinkedIn, you're missing out. I mean, all of these relationships happen just because there's like minds around this topic. Um, but I've gotten the pleasure to spend some time with Zach Mercurio over the last year and a half. He is an absolutely inspirational and insightful author and speaker. His book, The Invisible Leader, is at registration. You can check that out. But Zach is going to give you some thought bombs that are going to transition us nicely to tomorrow. So today was all about individual purpose. Tomorrow we're going to go deep on organizational purpose. And we couldn't think of a better bridge speaker of anyone that we had today that can really bring those two things together than Zach. So we have Zach live with us. There he is. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Zach Mercurio. Thanks, Davin. Thanks, everybody. It is amazing to see you there. I wish I was there. I wish I was there because there's four inches of snow right now on the ground. I'm looking out my window right now in Colorado and there's four inches of snow, but there's no place I'd rather be than with you here today. And you have been exploring all day individual purpose uh, and how to awaken it and how to uncover it, how to uncover your contribution. And right now I'm going to take us a step back and I wanna talk about what I think has to come before purpose which is mattering. I've had the in opportunity in, in my career over the last 10 years to work with thousands of people on what makes life and work meaningful from window washers and factory workers to social entrepreneurs and CEOs on what creates the sustained experience of purpose in everyday life. And there's one thing that we find is in common with all of them. And that it's people who experience high levels of purpose and high levels of meaningfulness all experience repeated moments of mattering. That is, they experience others showing them how their uniqueness is valued. Now, so think about all you've learned about purpose today, right? And if purpose is your contribution, then to discover and uncover that purpose, you first need to believe that you have something to contribute. If we want other people, look to your left, look to your right, around you to contribute in their own unique way, they first have to believe they have something to contribute. If we want people to soar with their strengths and use their strengths, people first have to believe that they have strengths that are worth contributing. And what we know from the motivation research is that it's incredibly easy for nothing to matter to a human being who doesn't believe that they matter. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Almost the prerequisite for experiencing purpose, which is believing that we matter. And as Davin mentioned, I'm the bridge speaker. I kind of like that being a bridge because mattering is key to creating communities where purpose is unlocked. And so let's dive in to what mattering is. And when we think about mattering, mattering is the belief that we are a significant part of the world around us. And it's a belief that arises when we both know we are valued by others and we know exactly how we add value to others. We know we are valued by others and we know exactly how we add value to others. Now, it seems like common sense, right? And every time I do a talk or do a workshop on mattering, inevitably someone is like, Zach, this is, this is common sense. 
But the problem with common sense, as Stephen Covey once said, is that it's not common practice. And unfortunately, mattering is not common practice. A recent survey found that over 67% of American workers feel unacknowledged in work. 43% of American workers in a sample of over 3,000 workers in diverse occupations say they experience invisibility at work, that they're not even seen. And if you have a student or work with a young person who's in school, a recent piece of research came out, they studied 66,000 people, kids, from ages sixth grade through 12th grade. And they asked them, if you were absent, do you think your teacher would notice if you were gone? Over 55% of the students said that they didn't think they would be noticed if they were gone. Mattering, creating mattering, creating environments where people feel noticed, they feel seen, they feel affirmed, and they feel needed is not common practice. But today, uh, as a result of this bridge session at the end of the day, we're going to together commit to some simple foundational practices to create mattering, to make sure that every human being that interacts with you knows that they matter and exactly how they matter so that they can uncover their own unique purpose. And right now, Mattering is an imperative. What we know is that after every major financial or social disruption in history, an existential crisis and feelings of worthlessness and insignificance follow. And almost every time, these are unaddressed by our modern organizations. In the second industrial revolution, sociologist Emily Durkheim did an enduring study of suicides. And what he found was that as jobs were becoming automated, it wasn't the loss of income from the job that was causing the mental health distress. What he found was it was the loss of the ability to contribute to society, to feel like we're worth something, to feel like we have a use and usefulness. In the Great Recession, we found that uh, after the Great Recession, uh, uh, visits to mental health facilities were four times higher after the Great Recession for people who kept their jobs because that feeling of job insecurity created a forethought of feelings of worthlessness and uselessness or meaninglessness. When we look at uh, the Great Depression, we find that experiences of a loss of identity, a loss of contribution to society was almost as damaging as the loss of the job itself. And now here we are, right? We're all gathered here at the precipice of a next generation of who we're gonna become in terms of a society of leaders and communities and organizations. And what we have now is we have a COVID pandemic that has revealed an increased reflection on the quality of our jobs and our lives. Research out of the United Kingdom finds that people are reflecting more than ever on the why of their lives and the quality of their lives. We know that frontline workers, all of the people, a lot of the people who actually made the event you're at right now possible have been told by governments that they're essential. And now they're coming back into work and they're saying, do I feel essential through policy, through pay, through how I'm treated? There's not only job insecurity, but add into that health insecurity right now. You have the unemployed who are returning to work. The most pervasive mental health challenge for unemployed people is feelings of what? Anti-mattering, meaninglessness, worthlessness. And then you have rising social injustice taking its rightful place in the center narrative. And it all comes together for this moment where I think that we're seeing a collective meaning deficit, where people are going to be coming back into our organizations. People are going to be coming back into work and there's gonna be feelings of uselessness, worthlessness, and insignificance. And the place where 30 people spend over 30% of their waking lives is a key place to fill this meaning deficit. But we can do this all around us. And the key, I think, and research shows, is creating communities and moments of mattering. Creating moments of mattering to answer to this meaning deficit, to this existential confusion that we're in right now. And I believe that the ability to create repeated moments of mattering is going to be the key leadership skill for the next century and beyond. And when we think about mattering, 
we, we have to think about work because work comprises the third of our lives that we're not sleeping for. And so how we make meaning in work is inevitably how we make meaning in life. And Studs Terkel, in his interview of grave diggers to CEOs to accountants, found one similarity in people of what work means to people. And he said this, he said, work is about a search for daily meaning as well as daily bread, for recognition as well as cash, for astonishment rather than torpor. In short, for a sort of life rather than a Monday through Friday sort of dying. The place where people spend over a third of their lives is a key place that we must create communities of mattering. Why? Because those people go home. They have friends, they have families, they vote, they buy things. And when people feel like they don't matter, anti-mattering follows, despair follows, and often we see acts of desperation. So what I'm going to be talking about right now takes place within the work context, but it's a life context. It's our whole social circle. Does everybody know that they're an irreplaceable human being with a life, and vivid and as, with a life as vivid and complex as your own? And when we look at this research in the workplace, we find that over 80% of workers in almost every occupation find that experiencing meaning and meaningfulness is a daily top priority. And it's not surprising, right? What would you do to feel significant? What would you give up to feel significant? Feeling significant, feeling a sense of mattering is not a generational need. It's a primal human desire. We're wired for it. So how do we do this? Mattering helps to create meaningfulness. And meaningfulness, we know, is a necessary predictor of things like engagement, motivation, and satisfaction. Now, when all of those three things are happening, research finds we get fulfillment. But oftentimes, what we do in organizations and what we do in our lives is we try to get motivation, we try to get engagement, we try to get satisfaction, we try to measure those things. And the problem is, is that all of those things are lagging indicators. Engagement is a lagging indicator of something that already happened. We know the number one predictor of engagement is what? Psychological meaningfulness. We know the number one predictor of motivation is psychological meaningfulness. The number one predictor of job satisfaction is psychological meaningfulness. All of those things come together for fulfillment. So the next generation leaders and the next generation organizations that create mattering consistently are focusing on the leading indicator of engagement, which is meaningfulness. I feel positive, I feel significant, and I feel purposeful. And we know that's most predicted by experiences of mattering. It's hard to feel engaged in something when you don't feel like you matter. It's hard to have energy for something when you don't feel like it matters. And it's hard to feel satisfied when you don't feel like you have gifts that are worthy of contributing. And so that's where we're starting today. And I wanted to give you that picture of where this fits in to what I see as the future of leadership. But right now, I want you to take a moment, our first moment of active reflection. And I want you to think back to the first moment in your life or work when you believed that you mattered. Describe the moment in your mind, the first moment in your life and if, if life is too big for you right now at four o'clock Michigan time uh, to think that far back, that's okay. Think about work. Maybe that's more relevant to you. But think about that time when you first believed that you mattered. What was happening? Who was around? What was going on? What was said? What did it feel like? Just think about that. Bring the person to mind that made you feel like you mattered. And chances are just thinking about that person right now is causing you to crack a little smile or there was some sort of emotional weight attached to that moment. It could be a parent who always told you you could do whatever you wanted to do. It could be a, a, a high school guidance counselor who believed in you. It could be someone who just looked at you on the sidewalk and asked you how you're doing. But oftentimes what we find is there are three commonalities with those moments. So after, as you go off into networking tonight, ask people what they thought about in this session, what that moment was. You talk about an in-depth networking question instead of, hey, what do you do? Hey, when's the first experience in your life when you felt like you mattered? That's a good way to break the ice. 
And think about those elements. And what you'll find and what we find in the research is there are three things that create a moment in of mattering. And I call it the NAN model. And I like NAN because in computer coding language, when you're coding data, it means not a number. So it's easy to remember and attach to mattering. The first is noticed. So you probably felt seen. Someone paid attention to you. Maybe they remembered a personal detail about you. Maybe they checked in on that personal detail. You know those people who after six months, you've emailed them six months ago, you say, hey, how's it going? And they say, hey, how's that project you were, go you were working on? And all of a sudden you feel seen, right? Or that person who notices a strength that you have and names it. A person that remembers unique things about your, you and your life. That's being noticed. Or those moments probably had some sort of affirmation in common where someone said, hey, you have a strength and your strength is valuable. You have unique gifts. You make a difference. That's being affirmed. Or, and someone showed you that you're needed. They showed you that you and your ideas and that your voice, you are indispensable. That you are absolutely irreplaceable as a human being. When these three things are happening, this is when the magic of mattering happens. Noticed, affirmed, and needed. Now today, we're going to go over some skills and practices that you can enact in each of these areas to create repeated moments of mattering. Now remember, you may think this is common sense, but as I mentioned, it's not always common practice. And here's the power of mattering. Mattering is one of the most powerful psychological constructs because we have the power to do it for others. It's one of the most powerful psychological concepts out there, the most powerful forces that we can create for other people. And here's how it works. When I believe that I matter because of other people showing me that I matter, we create this reinforcing loop. So I believe that I matter, I get the evidence of my mattering, of my meaning. It reinforces my belief that I matter. And this is how we create cycles and upward spirals of communities of mattering. Now, what we find and what I find in my research is that just knowing that you matter and believing it is not enough without the consistent evidence of your own significance. And that's where purpose becomes a community effort and an organizational effort? How do we create communities that give people the evidence of their significance? Let me show you what this looks like in action. This is Ellen. She is a janitor at Colorado State University. She was in a study I did on how janitors and people in frontline work experience meaningfulness and purpose. Now, Ellen did not want to be a janitor. She told me, that was the last thing she wanted to do. She was near homelessness, just needed a job for a paycheck, saw a job posting, got the job as a janitor. And she said that during her first week on the job, she continuously doubted herself over and over again. Why am I here? What is my worth? And that was when she tells me 30 years ago in her first week on the job, a supervisor pulled her aside and said, hey, I see you struggling. And I just want to define something for you. And he pulls out a dictionary and he defines the word custodian for her as a person responsible for looking after something, looking after a space and all the people in it. And she said that that one minute conversation was the first time in her life where someone showed her that she had real responsibility. She says it completely shifted her belief system about herself. Now, if you look at Ellen here, I want you to notice one thing. You'll see all the hats on Ellen's uh, lap. She crochets hats because she is a janitor in a university dormitory where all the students stay. And every winter she crochets hats for every single student in her dormitory. And I asked her why. And she said, Zach, because I'm responsible for them. And when I go to my car in the winter, I wanna be able to see them wearing my hat so I can be reminded of why my job exists. I asked Ellen, I said, Ellen, what's the most meaningful part of your job? And she said, well, Zach, the most meaningful part of my job is actually the most miserable. 
It's cleaning the bathrooms on Monday morning after a weekend in the dormitory. Imagine that. And she said, it's the most meaningful part of my job. And I said, why? She goes, because every time I go in to clean the bathroom, before my cloth even hits that toilet seat, I say to myself, I'm cleaning this so that these kids don't get sick. I'm cleaning this so that I can be responsible for these kids. Here's what we find. People who experience high levels of meaningfulness have that so that mentality. They can connect a seemingly discreet and sometimes not pleasurable task to its ultimate outcome. And let me tell you, purpose is not pleasurable all the time. Purpose is not what you do. It's the impact you make through what you do. That so that mentality. But the second thing to notice about Ellen, where did she learn that belief? She learned it by a supervisor taking one minute to show her she had responsibility. Ellen is one of the most sought after janitors at Colorado State University where I teach. People fight over her because she's amazing at what she does. That's the power of mattering. One moment of mattering can completely alter the trajectories of someone's life, their self-beliefs, and can create the conditions for someone to believe that they have purpose. And what we know in the research is that repeated moments of mattering increase a sense of self-worth, increase motivation, increase serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin. These are the neurotransmitters that control for mood, for movement, for motivation. We know in studying mattering amongst adolescents that one of the key predictors of lower depression is regular moments of mattering in school and work and in families. Do people feel seen? Do they feel affirmed? And do they feel needed? We know it lowers anxiety. We know it lowers stress repeated moments of mattering. And let me give you an example of how powerful knowing that you're needed is. Harvard scientist, Ellen Langer, did a really powerful study and she studied nursing home residents. And what she did is for one group of nursing home residents, all she did was give them a plant and she said, hey, you are responsible for keeping this plant alive. The other group, which was the control group in the study, she didn't give them anything. She controlled for genetic predisposition, genetic risk factors, early mortality risk factors, comorbidities. And what she found was remarkable. After 18 months in this controlled experimental study, she found that twice as many residents who were tasked with keeping the plant alive were alive after 18 months than the control group. That sense of having a responsibility, of knowing that I'm needed, that something, even a plant, helped optimize health outcomes. Studies like this have been replicated that found when people have that bigger sense of responsibility, that purpose, when they matter to someone else or something else, it's incredibly powerful. And just as powerful as mattering is, equally as powerful is the experience of anti-mattering. Now, there was a group of window washers that I was asked to work with. And the supervisor said to me, Zach, you got to go motivate those people. This is how my engagements in organizations usually start. Someone says, Zach, go fix them. They're not motivated. And so I go into this group and all I asked was, I said, hey, if you could improve anything here, what would you improve? And th these people like shot up. They were, they were so excited to talk. It's amazing what happens when you value another human being's wisdom. And one woman in the front said, Zach, I've been coming here for nine years. And the first thing I do every day when I come in is I clean the bottom floor windows of this building in this industrial complex that we're responsible for. But every afternoon at 3 p.m., the sprinkler system comes on. And the sprinklers are aimed towards the windows and they splash the windows. And so the next day I get up and I come in and I have to do something that I know is futile and preventable. And I have to clean those watermarks off the windows. She said, in my second year on the job, I went to my supervisor and I said, hey, is there anything that we can do about the sprinkler? And they said, no, it's the sprinkler people's problem. Every day she comes in and does something. Her voice isn't heard. She experiences futility. And a sense of futility is the enemy of mattering. And every day she felt that. 
And she said it raked on her. And then another guy spoke up and she said, yeah, Zach, the administrators, the managers were ordering vacuum cleaners for our maintenance division. And I do some work on our maintenance division as well. And I asked them if I could give them some feedback on the vacuums. And they said, no, it's okay. We, we got it taken care of. And he said that when they got the vacuums, they were too wide. They wouldn't fit through the doors. And he said, that's what I wanted to tell them. Was this a motivation problem? No. This was a mattering problem. And here's what people told me in my interviews of what anti-mattering feels like. That woman I mentioned, she said, it really rakes on me and makes me feel worthless as a person. Why do I bother? The second is it feels completely pointless. I feel pointless as a person. Experiences of anti-mattering rake on people. And you may be sitting here thinking, I'm at the Purpose Summit. We don't do that in my organizations. You have a sprinkler problem. I guarantee there's some small thing that's creating a moment of anti-mattering. And when you become a mattering leader, you can pinpoint those things that may create that sense of futility. And here's what we know. When someone doesn't believe that they matter, it's easy for nothing to matter. Mattering, though, what's great about all of this is it's a leadership skill. It's a fundamental skill. I grew up in Rhode Island and my dad was a big Patriots fan and he, was, he would always take me to training camps. And I'd be so excited because guess who I wanted to see at the training camps? I always wanted to see the quarterbacks, right? Because the star quarterbacks, you know, you see them in the game, they're doing amazing things. But I was really upset because every time I'd go to training camp, the quarterback was the most boring position to watch. All they would do over and over again is the same little footwork drills didn't even look like they were doing anything. They do this like over and over like this, like exactly what I'm doing right now for three hours. It was so boring. Great leadership is boring. And what I mean by that is that these amazing athletes were amazing because they practiced the fundamentals every day. Creating mattering is a fundamental practice. Noticing people, affirming people, needing people. These are the fundamentals. And great leaders practice the fundamentals of being human every single day. It's not flashy, but it's what leaves a legacy. So how do we do that? First, let's dive into some tools around noticing others. So noticing others is making eye contact, taking an interest, uh, remembering personal details, and making sure we're checking in with people. There was a five-year-old boy who grew up in Brooklyn, and he was the son of a single mother. And his mother had to work every single day. And he would go to the Brooklyn Library every single day, and he would take with him his prized possession. Now, his prized possession was a deck of trading cards, uh, of, 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 um, of cards, a deck of cards. And he'd bring this deck of cards to the library and he'd shuffle it. And he, he said he loved having a deck of, card, deck of cards because it could uh, made him feel like he had something. And uh, two weeks, day after day, after going to uh, the library, he came back one day and the librarian came up to him and said, hey, I, I noticed you with that deck of cards and we just got a book in. Uh, about doing card tricks, would you like to have it? And the librarian gave him this book of card tricks and he said he learned a card trick that day. His mom picked him up from work, he showed her the card trick and he was blown away by her response. And he recounted this all on the Joe Rogan podcast years later because that next week the librarian brought him a Houdini book. And that Houdini book was all about doing tricks and magic, and he was addicted. That person, that five-year-old boy, is the illusionist, the magician, David Blaine. And what he said in that Joe Rogan podcast is he said that that one librarian taking an interest in him when he was five is responsible for where he is today. Now think about what that librarian did, right? She noticed him. She thought about him when she wasn't even seeing him. 
And then she thought to do an action, to take action on what she remembered about him. How many thousands and thousands of people did a librarian at the Brooklyn Library, how many thousands of people did she see every day? But she remembered him, she noticed him. The power of one moment of noticing somebody can change the trajectory of people's lives. It can also galvanize teams. This is Ernest Shackleton's crew in 1915. Shackleton's ship, the Endurance, was marooned on a block of ice off of Antarctica. And one of the last things, if you're a leader, right, one of the first things to do if this happens is, how do we survive? What are we going to do to get through this? His reaction was, who needs me right now to get through this? And when we look at the diaries of all of his crew members, one of the most remarkable things that we found is they all wrote that he had gone up to each of them and asked about their kids' birthdays, the holidays that they cared about, uh, all of these personal details. And what he would do is he would go around daily, weekly, and check in on them, check in on these, these their, how they're feeling. He would talk to the scientists about their science, the astronomers about their stars, the navigators about the navigation, the people who are mopping the decks about mopping the decks. But more importantly, when it was a holiday that one of his crew members wanted to celebrate, he would actually get the stores of food out and create meals for people to celebrate each person's holiday, right? And they said, we felt like he knew us. And when Shackleton went away for almost five months to get help and left them on Elephant Island, he came back and one of the first things he did was not say, hey, I'm here to save you, look at me. He started connecting with each one of them and connecting and checking in on how each one of them was doing. When people sense that they matter to us, they'll do anything, even survive together. And this was the only expedition during that time where all of the crew members came back. So how do we do this? How do we put this into practice? Well, one of the first things we can do is make eye contact with people. I wish I could do that with you directly here right now, but make eye contact with people. See people, look at them, bring your head up and show people that you're interested in them. But the second thing is asking about, remembering and checking in on others' personal details. And you may think again, this is common sense. So let me give you an uh, example. I was working with a big distribution center and there was a lot of, they had a big engagement and turnover issue. And there was a lot of teams that had really low morale, but there was this one team that was always fired up. And they would say things about their supervisor, like she just gets us. She always has our back. We do anything for her. And I'm like, how does, how does she do this? How does this woman do this? And so I went in and I asked her, I was like, how do you create this morale? What do you do? What are you doing differently? And she said, Zach, I'm a taskmaster. I'm a numbers person. I love looking at the efficiency of the numbers. And she goes, I realized that that didn't motivate people. So she said that about three years ago, and she took out this moleskin notebook, this ratty notebook. And she said, I would check in. I would overhear people having conversations with each other. And I would write down little notes to myself about what they were saying about their personal life. So if they were talking about their hobbies, if they were talking about whether their family members were sick, if they were talking about their kids, I would write down little notes. And she said, every week I went in to work. And before I met with each of them, I would look at those notes I wrote down and I would check in with each person about their individual details. How's your dad doing in the hospital? How's that new hobby you're learning? And she said that once she started doing that, her team changed. Again, she wasn't just a natural relational leader. That notebook, it was a deliberate practice. So ask about, remember, and check in on others' personal details. One of the best questions to ask yourself is what don't I know about the people around me? What don't I know about the people on my team? And it's an incredibly powerful and convicting uh, question to ask. I remember I was doing a session on mattering at the beginning of the pandemic. And I remember seeing my neighbor, actually I can see out my, my front office. I remember seeing him around there and I had moved into my house about a year prior. And I realized that I knew he was retired, but I had never asked him what he did before he was retired. For the 45 years before I lived a hundred feet from him, 
I didn't ask what he did. It is so powerful how easy it is to forget to create mattering for other people. Your UPS driver, your FedEx driver, do you know their last name? Do you know if they have kids? Do you know their ambitions, their dreams? That executive assistant, do you know their kids' names? Do you know what sports they like? Do you know what vacation they want to have planned? Do you know what their dream career is? How about that team member you've been working with for 10, 11, 15 years? Do you know what they struggle with? And some people ask me, well, Zach, I know people on my team. You can know someone but not notice them. I know people who have a best friend, but they can't notice when that best friend is struggling. I know people that have known people for 15 years, but the act of noticing uh, someone's change in their life is a practice. It's a skill. Noticing others' moods, inquiring, and offering to do something to help. A lot of people say, I have a lot of empathy. And I want to take it a step further and move towards compassion, which is empathy plus action. If you notice someone's mood, do you offer an action to help? You know, oftentimes we go around, how's everybody doing? And people are like, oh, it's the pandemic, you know, just trying to get through. How many times do you offer an action to help? That's noticing. And appreciate people's small, everyday acts. Honor people's presence. So here's another active reflection for you. And if you're virtually, you can put your ideas in the chat. I want you to just in your mind, make a list of people that you see your talk with daily. And who do you need to notice more? And what's one action you'll take to help them feel noticed? I recently uh, realized that my kid, who is six years old, he loves his tablet. It's always like, dad, when can I watch my tablet? And I realized I would be like, we're not watching the tablet today. Or when he's on his tablet, I'd say, get off your tablet, you know, come to the dinner table. And then I started reviewing my research on noticing. And instead of doing that, I would just come sit next to him. And I would say, hey, what are you watching? What do you like about it? What do you love about this? And let me tell you what happened. He takes the tablet, tablet starts slowly going down and he starts talking with me. He wanted to feel seen. Even at six years old, he felt noticed. Who do you need to take an interest in? Is it your spouse who walks to get coffee? You go by each other in the morning and you don't ask, how are you feeling today? What are you thinking about? What is your attention? One of the most powerful ways to do this is to do more authentic check-ins before you jump into the, hey, how are you doing today questions. Ask other questions like, what is your attention right now? What kind of day have you had so far? How would you describe your energy right now? How are you feeling? How are you doing? Just this shift, right? If you can create a little space to cultivate ways of being with one another, it can crack open that relationship. And you can do this with anybody. Another one that I like to do is just a general check-in. It's a green, yellow, red check-in. It comes from the Reboot Institute with a good friend, Jerry Colonna. And you go around and you just say, how are you doing? You know, rate your, rate your mood, green, yellow, red. And you just have people rate their moods. And what you find is that if you're in a group of people and you have people go around and people say, I'm red, what you do is you compel empathy. Imagine being in a small group meeting and then all of a sudden someone says, I'm a red. And then the group just leaving and saying, oh, Susan's a red. You know, I'll just go to my next meeting. <laughs> no, we're compelled to then ask, how are you doing? And it's a really powerful way to take a pulse and get a sense and give people the opportunity to be before you do with one another. And let me give you an example of how noticing affected my life. This is my now three-year-old. So this is not when he was three, but this is Jackson. He was born with an incredibly rare condition called blepharophimosis epicanthus inversus syndrome, BPES. It affects about one in 50,000 people. He was born without eyelid muscles and his eye openings are much narrower and smaller than most kids. He opens his eyes by connecting his eyelid to his eyebrow muscles. Pretty amazing. Kids are amazing. Humans are amazing. But I experienced a lot of anti-mattering for Jackson because we would take him to playgrounds and kids would look at him and say, why are your eyes so small? Why are you so weird? Your eyes are really weird. The kids would come up to us as parents and be like, why are his eyes so weird? Um, and I felt that, right? I felt that anti-mattering for him. 
as he was growing up, because I knew he couldn't feel it himself. He didn't know what was going on. Some people would say, why is your baby so sleepy? You know, what's wrong? And then I remember we went down to Denver Children's Hospital. And in Denver Children's Hospital, we went down to his first surgery appointment. And as parents, we were freaked out. But I remember these two volunteers. They got up from behind their desk. They didn't even look at us. They got down on their knees, got to Jackson's eye levels and said, you are the cutest thing. We are so glad that you're here. In an instant, you could see a two-year-old relax. For the first time, he didn't need us to hold him. He could just bumble around on the floor. I remember he went up to the volunteer and grabbed his leg. He's a really shy, introverted kid, I swear. But that moment of mattering, of being seen, was profound. When we notice people, it changes everything. The second piece of mattering is affirming others. Affirming is showing people how their unique gifts make a difference. And this is key, right? 40% of people feel they are undervalued in work. So the skill of affirming people is important. And one of the best ways to do this is to make sure people know how their unique strengths make a human impact. Real affirmation is showing somebody how their uniqueness makes a difference. I've heard a lot about the individual aspects of purpose today, and it's where your strengths, your uniqueness, your unique strengths make a particular impact, that intersection. People who create mattering show people how their uniqueness makes a difference. And one of the best practices is through what I call high impact storytelling. Telling people and showing people the human beings that they impact. Uh, this, I tell this story every time I do a talk. So if you've heard me do a talk before and you're like, he's going to tell the MRI story, it's one of the coolest stories I have. So I have to tell it. But I was going into a distribution center, a ballroom, and there was these distribution center managers. Now they distribute very small widgets that go into a uh, medical device manufacturer and fabricator that then fabricates MRI machines and, and distributes them. They're like four steps removed from an end user. I do a lot of work with factory workers on meaningfulness. Now I go in and this group was like, okay, who's this purpose guy? I could tell they were not happy to be there. One guy even said, uh, oh my gosh, I hope this guy's not boring. I mean, as speakers, we can also hear what you're saying, but I go in and that's how bad it was. That's how bad the room was. And so I just stopped the session. I said, why are you here? And this one woman started crying in the front. And I'm like, oh no, I screwed this up. And she started crying and she raised her hand and she goes, no one's ever asked me that before. I've been here for 13 years. No one's ever asked me why I'm here apart from what I do or what I get for what I do. And then she started crying more. And I was like, wow, I really messed this up. She goes, I'm realizing why my job has existed for the first time right now, right here. She said, I was diagnosed with an early stage cancer. Last month, I was in an MRI machine. I looked up at the MRI machine and I remember seeing a logo I see on the boxes imprinted in our distribution center. And she goes, I remember seeing that logo on all of the boxes, all of the discarded boxes. And she said this verbatim to her group of peers. She said, I'm realizing right now that my job has existed to save my own life. You talk about an antidote to employee disengagement, that room changed, right? That story of mattering, that what you're doing, regardless of what it is, inevitably impacts another human being, changed everything. That group, they stayed for three hours that day and they brainstormed how they brought, could bring those stories down to the people that are packing boxes in the distribution centers. And we started bringing in a customer story for every uh, safety meeting that they had, where, when, and how might you better be able to show people the human impact they have through a story. This is Dr. Turner. He's a radiologist in Israel. He did a study on what knowing our human impact does for us. He looked at radiologists who work from home and he sent two groups of scans out. One group of scans he sent to a group of radiologists uh, and he had them interpret the scans, send them back. The other set of scans he sent to a group of radiologists, had them interpret the scans and send them back. One group, he did something different. He put the headshot of a patient on the scan and he was measuring what their output would be. Unbelievably, 
The radiologist that saw the headshot of the patient on the scan ended up writing 20% longer interpretive findings and finding 15% more uh, incidental findings that would be important for the patient's future prognosis. Do you know that whole adage when you put a face to the name? When you show somebody how their uniqueness makes a difference on another human being, you create mattering. This is a group of commercial plumbing contractors I worked with. Uh, it's a very well-known group, uh, international group of, of, of plumbing contractors. I go in and uh, here they are sitting there. I took a picture of when I was about to go in. This is after a 14 hour plumbing shift. Here comes the mattering and purpose guy, Zach, right? Into their uh, warehouse area. And I come into the front and I could just see them. And they were literally talking to each other like, oh gosh, what are we doing here? Why are we here? Can we go home? Where's the food? And I go up and all I did was show them this picture. There's my six-year-old stuffing his face with a donut. There's a good picture to end your day, pure joy on a six-year-old's face. But the reason why I showed them that is I said, what do you see happening here? And one guy was like, your kid likes donuts. And I was like, yeah, thanks. Good, good observation. But what you know, what you're about to know is that if you look behind him, that area is called the plaza, the exchange. It's a plaza in Fort Collins, Colorado, the city I live in. This company actually did the plumbing infrastructure for that project. My kid is eating a donut at his favorite donut shop, which occupies one of the buildings in that plaza uh, in, in Fort Collins. And so I showed them this and I said, no, look closer. What do you see here? And they looked and then all of a sudden they started shuffling. And one of the plumbers raised his hand and said, that's the exchange. And they all shot up. Nonverbals changed. They said, we work on that project. We did that. And I said, yes, you make the every day, every Saturday, not every day, that would be bad. You make this possible. A plumber came up to me after and said, I've been a plumber for 30 years. I've never thought about the human beings who use the buildings I plumb for. When you create mattering, people change. One way to do this is not just through stories, but through affirmation. Over the next couple of days, you're going to say thank you to somebody. One of the best habits you can develop is right before you say thank you, make sure you commit to not just saying thank you or good job, but you actually tell them exactly how they made a difference for you in your life or your day. One of my favorite frameworks to use is called the SBI model. So anytime you're going to give feedback or, or affirmation or say thank you, that you show them exactly the situation where whatever you're thanking them for happened. So for example, at the beginning of this session, when Davin got up, he had very, uh, got up on stage to introduce me. That's the situation. And when you describe the situation, you remind people that you're noticing them. So you remind people that you saw them doing something. And it, 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 it's not like the just, hey, thank you. I get a lot of people in manufacturing that say, Zach, we're good. I walk the line. And I go, what do you do when you walk the line? I say, hey, that doesn't really do anything. Notice people. So when and where did it happen? What was the behavior? So Davin had open body language and he smiled and he introduced me, right? So show them their unique strengths, open body language, that smile, right? That energy. And then finally, show people the impact that it had on them. So name their strengths, name their behavior, show them the impact. It made me feel really relaxed and it set the stage to be able to create moments of mattering for you all to go create for everyone else. So situation, behavior, impact. If there's one thing you can commit to for the rest of the year is don't say thank you without showing someone the difference that they make. Don't say good job without showing them exactly how their strengths make a difference. Because what you're doing is you're fueling their understanding of their purpose, where their strengths make a difference. You're giving them the opportunity, the foundation of mattering to do that. And we can do this in jobs too. Make sure that before you ever give a job or before you ever give a task or you evaluate a task, you're focusing on three things, right? Significance. I know how this task benefits others. Make sure that your job descriptions, right? You show people the human problem that their tasks exist to solve. Make sure you show them what their task makes possible. So what is the bigger product? What is the bigger process? What's the bigger project? 
and then remind them how they can use their strengths to do it. Significance, identity, and strengths. This is a really powerful model to use. Anytime you delegate a task to anybody, even if it's your kid and you want them to do chores, don't just say, hey, I'm the dad, go get, take the trash cans out, right? Have you ever been really fired up to do something because someone told you you had to do it? No, instead say, hey, that would really help me be able to get dinner ready if you put the trash cans out. And you know what, by you doing that, we're not gonna have to do that tomorrow morning. And it shows me that you're a helpful kid. Significance, identity, strengths. You can use it in delegating a task, performance evaluations, onboarding before you show someone what to do or how to do it, make sure you show them why it matters. It's called meaningful job design. Are these three components present for you? And then finally, ask more meaningful questions. We tend to ask a lot of anti-mattering questions. What do you wanna do with your life? It's a pretty bad question. All you're ever gonna get is a linear checklist of things to do. Your possibilities actually narrow as you get more specialized. Instead, maybe we can ask people, what do you want your life to do for others? Because you're implying that they're important now. Oftentimes, the way our educational systems and organizations are set up, we have people live in an if-then argument. If you get to the weekend, then you'll be rested. If you get this job title, then you'll be successful. If you get this degree, graduate degree, then you'll be able to make an impact. But this shows people that they matter now. Where do you see yourself in five years? What kind of impact do you want to have made five years from now? What's your ideal job? What problems do you want to solve with your strengths? Take a look at the questions you ask. Your kids, the people around you, your teams, your recruits, the people you're hiring, and ask yourself, do I ask questions that reaffirm that that human being is irreplaceable and they matter right now? Or do I ask questions that show people that their worth is only dependent on what they do in the future for me? Because either way, you undercut mattering. So asking better questions, storytelling, story collecting, naming people's strengths. Uh, and one of the most powerful things to actually name and, and know people's strengths and use the language of their strengths regularly, show people how their strengths make a difference. Show them the impact they have on another human being. Show people how exactly what they do, what it makes possible. Don't just show people that they matter, show them exactly how they matter. That's the leadership skill. Anybody can tell someone that they matter. Purposeful leaders show people how they matter and ask more meaningful questions of people. So I wanna end with this last component here, which is making sure everybody feels needed and feels essential. And this is showing people that they're relied on and they're indispensable. In one of the most difficult studies to read, Gordon Flett, he's a psychologist. He recaps a study on the journal entries of people who were thinking about harming themselves or hurting themselves. And he found that there are two lines that come up in almost every journal entry. Nobody would miss me if I was gone and no one cares about me. The feeling of dispensability, of replaceability, of not being relied on by anybody. And this is why this final component of feeling needed is important. And to transition into tomorrow, one of the best ways that you can show people that they're needed, that they're indispensable, is to show them exactly how, if they weren't there, you would not be able to deliver your bigger purpose. You've, most of you have probably heard the NASA story, right? Where JFK was going down to give a speech uh, at NASA to launch the Apollo missions. He thought he was going into a green room to prep for this speech. It ended up he was getting, going into a mop closet. And he went up to a janitor and said, hey, what do you do here? Janitor very calmly got up and said, oh, Mr. President, I'm putting a person on the moon. Then went back to his work very calmly. Andrew Carton at the Wharton School did an archival study of NASA. That whole I'm putting a person on the moon belief didn't happen by accident. NASA at the time had over 300,000 contracted employees across the country working on an initiative to put a person on the moon by the end of the decade that almost none of them would actually be around to see happen. Talk about a management challenge. But what Carton found was that on the blackboards around NASA, everybody had a ladder to the moon. They had this big purpose, but then they had these objectives 
that all laddered down to the specific task they were working on that week. So the specific task, the specific job, all of a sudden you could see the tangible, measurable objective that that task made possible. All of a sudden you could see the tangible, measurable, higher order objective that that objective made possible. And they were able to clearly show people how their work was indispensable to delivering this bigger purpose. It's great to have an aspirational purpose, but it doesn't do anything unless people experience it every day. And when people feel like they matter, they can visibly see and know exactly how what they do is indispensable to this ladder. And laddering is not just a skill, it's a mindset. How can you connect people's everyday work, everyday inputs, whether it's at home, around you, to what they make possible. And one of the best things that's come out of this pandemic has been that we have a lot more essential thinkers around. We're realizing all of these people who are irreplaceable and indispensable to making our lives possible. But I wanna take that essential term away from the government and I wanna reclaim it as our own and be essential thinkers. What would it look like if you treated every single person you interacted with as an essential, irreplaceable human being. So one of my favorite ways to do this is to do an if it wasn't for you statement. So think of someone around you in your organization or in your life that may need to know that you rely on them. In your organization, you could use laddering to show them that they're indispensable and write them if it, if it wasn't for you statement. I always think about my days and I say, did I tell somebody if it wasn't for you and did I tell somebody how I rely on them? So to recap, try that if it wasn't for you statement. Show someone how you rely on them. Show them exactly and, and really measurably how they're indispensable. Notice when people are gone. It always astounds me that when we go from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting, uh, when someone's not there the last Zoom meeting and it's a regularly scheduled meeting, we just move on with the agenda most people do. Stop, say, we really missed you last week and we missed you because you bring this to the table. When you notice people's absence, you're affirming their presence matters. So making sure you're affirming people's presence, show people what they make possible and ask others for help. As a leader, the best thing we can do to create mattering is to give up authority and show people that we need them. Create a list of things that keep you up at night. Go to your people, put them on the board and ask, help. Help me with these things. That's how people start feeling needed. So notice, see people, affirm people, show people how their uniqueness makes a difference, show them that they're needed, and then create habits. One of the questions I'll leave you with today is to make mattering a habit. You know, for example, when I meet someone, I will ask their last name. These are called habit implementation intentions. When I start a meeting, I will ask people what has their attention today. Making sure that you're doing these things repeatedly, practicing the fundamentals, being the boring quarterback that's practicing the drills, that's what leaves a legacy. Another example is I will point out the specific strengths someone used when I say thank you. The other thing you can do, and I posted this in the chat on the app, is there's a self-assessment. You can take that self-assessment in each of these skill areas. You can deploy it to your teams. You can also do this grid. Think of people on your teams or in your family. Who needs to be noticed? Who needs to be affirmed? Who needs to be needed? I call this a mattering audit of your local community. And then think of this question as you leave here tonight. What is one mattering habit you will begin today, right now? And I want to end with one key point. Do you do this for yourself? So take that mattering model and think about now yourself. Do you check in with yourself? Do you notice how you're feeling? Do you acknowledge the small things that you do to make a difference? Do you ask yourself questions like, what do I have to do today? Or do you ask yourself questions like, how is what I'm gonna to do today gonna to impact other people? Do you remind yourself of your impact? Do you ask yourself, when did I feel like I mattered? Do you tell yourself stories that reaffirm the evidence of your own significance? Do you give yourself the evidence that you matter every day? Do you think about what you make possible? Do you think about who relies on you? Do you think about who needs you? 
So when we apply this to ourselves, we can create mattering for ourselves and create it for other people. And I think there's nothing more powerful than a human being who realize that they matter. Try one of these noticing actions and see what happens to a human being because you, everybody in this room, you're an irreplaceable, indispensable human being. Uh, I, I remember one of your speakers talked about his chances of surviving that, those plane crashes. And it's amazing, right? The chances of you being are born are like one in 400 quadrillion. You do one in 400 quadrillion by the amount of people here. This event happening right now is a miracle. And each person is indispensable. And just think about how many people would be able to uncover and discover their purpose if everyone believed that they mattered. Thank you all so much. Have a great night. Um, and I appreciate everyone uh, listening and being here. And um, remember, make people feel noticed, make people feel affirmed, and show them how they're needed. Thank you all. For Zach Mercurio. So, Zach, I want to appreciate you and let you know that you matter, that your words, the things that you wrote when the bottom fell out and we were all struggling as authors, thought leaders, speakers, all that during the midst of the pandemic and finding the purpose in that helped me personally get through those times. And, you know, part of the our desire to keep moving forward to make this happen because there was this lost sense of mattering. People had lost the connection to the fact that they mattered because they were so disconnected was a key element in us pressing forward to make sure that this event happened. So thank you for making that difference.